Welcome everyone uh, to the Transnational Economic Law and Dispute Settlement Group of the Center for Comparative and Transnational Law at CUHK Law Seminar on Sustainability in EU-China Investment Relations. This, my name is uh, Professor Brian Mercurio and I will be the moderator uh, for this session and for the next two hours. Uh, this is a second of a series in a collaboration between CUHK Law, DLA Piper, and uh, University College London, and follows on from a successful panel on EU-China uh, uh, trade and investment relations that we held last month. There will be uh, four speakers uh, for today's event and one commentator. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, Manjo Xi, uh, who will speak on the implications of China-EU uh, comprehensive agreement on investment on the promotion of sustainable development. The second speaker is Declan Ketter, who will speak on sustainability in EU-China relations. The third speaker will be uh, Professor Anatole Boot, uh, who will speak on EU carbon border adjustment mechanism and implications for China. And the fourth speaker, um, will, uh, Ms. Uh, Jing Jing Zhang, will speak on investigating the environmental impact of Chinese companies. I'll give you a brief uh, introduction to all four speakers here, and, uh, and then uh, we will turn it uh, over. So uh, the first speaker, uh, uh, Professor Xi, is currently a founding director of the Center for International Economic Law and Policy at uh, the School of Law at the University of International Business and Economics, UAIB, in uh, Beijing. He's a very experienced academic uh, with, with many publications, both in, in English and uh, Chinese, focusing on uh, mainly investment, but also uh, trade law. He's a member of the ILA Committee of Rule of Law and International Investment Law, uh, steering committee member of Unser Charles Academic Forum on Investor State Dispute Settlement uh, Reform, and has served as a consultant for numerous agencies, including the United Nations SCAP and uh, the UN's ITC. Uh, Our second speaker is uh, Ambassador Declan Keller, who's now a senior advisor at APCO Worldwide. Uh, Ambassador Keller has a uh, very long, distinguished career in the Irish civil service. He was the permanent representative of Ireland to the United to the um, uh, European Union uh, in Brussels uh, from September 2013 till March 2020. Prior to that, he was the Irish ambassador to the People's Republic of China from 2004 to 2013, uh, and he also. Uh, served uh, uh, as ambassador and representative of Ireland to the EU Political and Security Committee in Brussels and chaired the committee during Ireland's 2004 presidency of the European Union. He had previous postings in, uh, in Washington at the embassy uh, in the United States, as well as at the Irish mission to the UN, among a host of other uh, distinguished positions. The third speaker is my good friend and colleague, Professor Anatole Boot, who is a professor at CUHK Law, specializing in the fields of energy, environment, and investment law. Uh, he focuses his work on the transition of energy systems towards sustainability, his special interest for energy market reform in emerging economies, uh, mostly Central Asia. Uh, he increasingly is turning to focus on, on China, and he is the uh, principal investigator of a few uh, uh, large research grants uh, looking at, uh, for instance, greenhouse ga gas emissions trading schemes in uh, China. Uh, and the final speaker is uh, uh, Zheng Jingjing, who is going to wake up extremely early in the morning to join us. I think it's now 4 a.m. Uh, where she is, and I also hear that she's jet lagged. She is a very prominent uh, Chinese environmental lawyer and uh, lecturer in law at the University of Maryland Law School and director of the Center for Transnational Environmental Accountability. 
Uh, she served as the inaugural litigation director at the Beijing-based Center for Legal Assistance to Pollution Victims from 1999 to 2008, and won several milestone environmental litigation cases in Chinese courts, um, uh, which, uh, which uh, got her uh, attention and also the nickname of China's Erin Brockovich. Uh, she was selected as the Yale World Fellow, uh, won the uh, CTNC Eco Award and the Women of Courage Award given by the U.S. Embassy in uh, Beijing in 2011. Um, her work features uh, really quite prominently in several large newspapers um, uh, and through uh, documentaries. Um, which you can, of course, see online. We will also have a commentator for today's session, and that is uh, also my friend and colleague, uh, Dini Seko, who is a research associate at uh, the Center for Comparative and Transnational Law at, at the uh, CUHK uh, Law Faculty. Um, Dr. Seko is, is a graduate of the PhD program uh, with us at CUHK Law and he researches and teaches in the areas of transnational legal issues and dispute uh, settlement, uh, most notably uh, uh, looking at um, state-owned enterprises and sovereign wealth uh, funds. So with that uh, long introduction, I just have uh, two more points to make. The first is, of course, we welcome any uh, dialogue and uh, questions. Uh, so while speakers are presenting, feel free to ask questions through the chat function. Uh, each speaker will speak for around 18 minutes, uh, but, um, but don't wait until the end to ask questions. Do feel free to ask them throughout uh, the, um, the talks. Uh, and I will just uh, finally, and I'll remind you of this before we conclude, um, thank you again for attending this uh, seminar. And uh, the center has a, a few upcoming events which you may be interested in as well. Uh, later this month, there's a workshop on anti-suit injunctions and FRAND litigation in China. That is on the uh, 17th of December. And then in the new year, we have two uh, um, other um, uh, webinars coming up. There's a property law seminar um, coming up on the 12th of January, which you can see on the screen. And there is the Greater uh, China Legal History Seminar Series. Uh, we'll also have our colleague Jian Li uh, present on the 21st of, of January uh, on copyright norms uh, to copyright law, looking at the evolution of uh, copyright in China. So, uh, with that, um, um, I now will turn over to our uh, first speaker, uh, Professor Xi. It's good to see you again. Uh, unfortunately, it's only it's only virtual, but hopefully we can catch up uh, in the new year at some point. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor McCreel, and thank you to uh, uh, CUHK for this kind invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to join uh, such a distinguished panel uh, on this very timely and important topic. So in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes, I'll just try to, to present my, my uh, perspective on the uh, China-EU um, uh, investment treaty. And then I, I would first of all try to provide a very general idea of what I have observed with regard to the treaty making in China and the EU, um, irrespective of uh, sustainable development, um, with a focus on the CHI. And then I try to uh, uh, present a few uh, distinct features of the CHI, which I, I actually uh, con conducted research together with a colleague uh, from Germany, uh, Dr. Axel Berger from the uh, uh, German Institute of Development. So he also earns a merit uh, in, in uh, some of my uh, presentation today. And finally, I would like to give a very brief uh, personal guess on the future um, and what is the impact of the CHI uh, to, uh, especially to China in its treaty making a sustainable development so let me just start by uh, a very brief introduction of the CHI. Uh, the CHI is, uh, is very recent. Um, strictly speaking, at this point of time, it is not a treaty. Uh, it's not been set as the ratified yet. It's just the parties have principally uh, agreed in principle the text of the CHI. Uh, that's early, early 2021, so it's almost a year from now. 
Uh, this is a hard win result of um, uh, 35 rounds of negotiations between the parties after almost seven years of hard work. So the parties actually deem uh, the CHI as, as a very important milestone of its treaty making and bilateral relations. So uh, around um, a, a dozen of uh, EU trade agreements now contain uh, sustainable development chapters. Uh, I, I, I noted that a few, a few days ago in a meeting that I attended, I, I uh, actually uh, got the impression that the EU is now pushing that very hard in its treaty making sustainable development, climate change. EU wants this to be the clauses in the future treaties and already EU, I would believe is a forerunner, a pioneer in this regard. Um, a, a number of EU treaties have uh, separate chapters on sustainable development. Uh, this is nothing new to, to the EU, but to China, this is something very, very, uh, very new. It's almost exceptional. I would say um, if we have a look at the China's treaty making, uh, especially uh, investment treaty making in the past two decades, we see there is a general trend of greenization. So basically that means uh, more uh, tides and more no a bigger number of environmental protection uh, clauses are included in Chinese investment treaties. So that basically form a trend of greenization of Chinese uh, bi bilateral investment treaties. Uh, and the same goes to a uh, labor protection, anti-corruption, and also uh, corporate social responsibility, but to a, a lesser degree. Uh, that means um, uh, recent Chinese treaties also uh, tend to include uh, clauses with regard to uh, these um, issues. Uh, so uh, with that, against this kind of background, the sustainable development section, which is um, um, a separate section or standalone section of the CHI is, is quite unusual to China. Um, it actually uh, deals with uh, different issues uh, uh, and subsections, uh, deals with corporate social responsibility, environmental protection, labor rights protection, and also uh, it, it addresses disagreements between uh, the contracting parties. So uh, the CHI is quite unique in a sense to China. Uh, with regard to a sustainable development. All, although I would not say that all the provisions of these sustainable development sections are new to China, uh, the structure and the way of negotiation and the potential uh, enforcement of this section uh, would be a very important uh, development of China's treaty making with regard to uh, sustainable development. So this turns to my second point with regard to a few distinct features of the CHI, which uh, I, I found uh, there are, of course, different perspectives to approach this issue. Uh, I know that there are also uh, discussions um, uh, from the European side and also criticisms from the European side uh, claiming the, the weak enforceability of some of the treaty uh, uh, provisions. And uh, of course, that would lead to the difficulty in, uh, in the ratification process. Um, uh, one of the, the uh, uh, distinct features that I found of the, uh, the sustainable development section of the CHI is that um, probably contrary to uh, many uh, have expected, the CHI uh, a sustainable development section does not actually impose many new substantive obligations on the parties. It is very lengthy uh, from the passage, um, uh, several pages and uh, a standalone section. Uh, the party's commitments are already largely based on the obligations they undertaken um, under existing international legal instruments. Uh, there are some examples, for example, um, uh, in the commitment to ratify and implement the Paris Climate Accord. Um, um, the section also allows the parties to determine its own sustainable development policies and priorities, establish levels of domestic uh, labor and environmental protection, and to adopt and modify its relevant laws and policies accordingly, uh, consistent with its multilateral commitment in the field of labor and environment. So uh, if we combine this together, uh, th the impression is that the obligations, especially the substantive obligations uh, with regard to sustainable development that is enshrined in uh, the CHI uh, section uh, is not really new or not really uh, too much 
of too much added value to the existing uh, treaty uh, treaties of the parties. And this is especially uh, the case uh, from the European perspective, because as I've already mentioned, a, a number of European treaties have already included the sustainable development uh, chapters and clauses, and many of these clauses are enforceable. Um, we will see that uh, in a recent uh, treaty uh, arbitration um, underlying the, the Korean and European uh, free trade agreement uh, in this regard. Uh, I, I discuss that a bit later. So this is the very first uh, feature or distinct feature what I, what I see uh, from, from the treaty. And the second feature is, like, um, is that a large part of the obligations under uh, this uh, sustainable development section are actually best endeavor uh, and uh, in nature. So it's more like encouraging the parties uh, to take or to adopt a high standard with regard to sustainable development. And the parties actually are left with broad discretional power in implementing the section. Uh, there are a number of these um, uh, examples. Uh, the parties, for example, are required to strive to ensure its laws and policies provide for the encouraged high level of environmental protection and labor rights. So these are the, the, uh, the words used uh, in the treaty, strive to ensure and encourage high level. Um, and there are other uh, examples such as the, the parties should work towards ratifying all uh, international labor organization conventions, which uh, is all but a heart requirement. This is, uh, if you consider the, the current situation in China, uh, this could be a, a difficult requirement for China. Uh, but again, uh, we see that the Kai took us, I wouldn't say the word soft, but it's, it's more flexible um, uh, position in this regard. It's more like the uh, encouraging uh, the parties, not only China, but, but also the EU, uh, in uh, adopting the higher standards. So and, and in so doing, uh, the, uh, the treaty actually uh, creates a kind of impetus for uh, the parties. But of course, there are also discussions and criticisms on this because uh, uh, there are many commentators believe that these kind of uh, best endeavor or best efforts clauses are, are, are actually weak in enforceability and is not really helpful in promoting sustainable development. Um, um, by the, the two uh, contracting parties. So a third uh, distinct feature uh, that I find uh, is that the uh, sustainable development section of the CHI, uh, it's quite unique to China in the sense that it provides for a mechanism for addressing disagreements relating to uh, sustainable development and investment. Uh, this is something I wouldn't say completely new to China, but this is the very first treaty that China has agreed that incorporates such a kind of disagreement uh, mechanism, settlement mechanism. Uh, the word disagreement is quite, I would say is quite broad. Um, I, my, my, my guess is that it goes beyond simply disputes or legal disputes that is underlying many of the treaties. Uh, it could be other kind of disagreements or simply, um, uh, differences in some treaties, they use the word difference. Um, this section, subsection uh, is quite new to China. Uh, from, a, from a procedural perspective, uh, this subsection uh, looks very much like a WTO panel procedure. So it's like a, a group of experts uh, a a formed a, a panel uh, like arbitrators in dealing with the, the, the dispute or disagreement submitted uh, by the parties uh, with regard to the chapter of sustainable development and investment. Uh, but in the same time, uh, this uh, treaty, um, the CHI uh, is also uh, new in the sense that it provides this kind of enforcement mechanism. Uh, this is uh, unprecedented in Chinese treaty making. Um, for the EU, uh, this is not new because as I've mentioned, uh, EU has uh, these kind of mechanisms in many of its treaties and the recent decision of an expert panel under uh, the sustainable development chapter of the EU Korea FTA, as I've already mentioned, um, actually uh, suggests that this mechanism is very helpful, uh, it's functional, and it could help enforce uh, sustainable development or obligations under uh, the treaty. Uh, 
Uh, but um, a closer look between um, uh, the SD section of the CHI and the SD second chapter of the EU Korean uh, FTA, we would find that there are, of course, differences in the wording. So, of course, uh, it's hard to say the same result uh, would be produced uh, had uh, the uh, sustainable development section of the CHI is uh, under uh, a dispute. So these are the three major uh, distinct features that I found of the uh, of the uh, CHI. Uh, but of course, I, uh, as I've already mentioned, I believe that different uh, different commentators would have different perspectives in, in, in addressing or in, in, in understanding uh, the features of the CHI. So uh, with that, let me, uh, in, the, in the final uh, two or three minutes, let me just try to, uh, to present my personal guess of the future of the treaty. Uh, the treaty, of course, um, is now um, uh, frozen uh, by, by the European uh, Union um, after some unpleasant uh, exchange of sanctions between the two parties. Uh, it has been uh, quickly politicized, uh, according to, uh, at least according to the Chinese perspective. Uh, well, but uh, from the legal perspective, uh, the treaty is now uh, under a ratification process, and given the current situation, it would be very difficult to have a, a, a clear guess uh, when and the treaty will be um, uh, ratified by both parties, and therefore, uh, I, I believe that, that we should all be a bit patient uh, with regard to uh, the final fate of this treaty. But aside from these, uh, these um, uh, unpredicted uh, development, I believe that the treaty itself, uh, from the perspective of a normative perspective, it, it, it is very important and is very, very um, um, uh, significant uh, to China and to the EU, especially to China's uh, treaty making process. I would even call it as a, a symbol of uh, China's uh, paradigm shift in uh, treaty making, bilateral investment treaty making, or even FTA treaty making. Uh, not only because this treaty for the first time include, includes a, a standalone um, uh, sustainable development chapter or section, but also because um, a number of reasons. And first, the treaty itself is comprehensive. This is very, very new to China. Uh, the comprehensiveness of the treaty is beyond doubt. We see that the treaty incorporates not only sustainable development, which is uh, quite new, uh, it also uh, uh, incorporates um, uh, market access and other uh, aspects, which are, um, I, I would say, which are uh, really um, a significant change of Chinese treaty making practice. And of course, uh, a second um, a reason is that I deem this treaty uh, quite uh, sustainable or uh, development oriented, uh, not only in the sense of the increase of uh, sustainable development provisions in the treaty, but more importantly, because of the potential enforceability of this chapter. Uh, but of course, as I've mentioned, uh, given the current uh, the, the difference in the wording um, of each individual treaties, uh, I believe that we should be uh, wait and see what exact impact um, or whether and to what ex extent uh, the certain treaty provisions would be put into uh, practice uh, by a adjudicatory body or an expert group um, in interpreting and enforcing. So this is something that deserves careful follow-up research. And a third point is that the treaty uh, is actually a, in nature a work in progress uh, result. It's not been sealed yet, at least uh, at this point of time, not only because it's not ratified, but also because the treaty itself intentionally uh, leaves uh, certain issues such as uh, invest, uh, investment protection, uh, dispute settlement for future negotiations. So therefore it is possible for both parties to build, to forge a better and stronger consensus on certain issues and to, uh, to actually build in uh, more uh, necessary provisions, uh, including provisions with regard to sustainable development. So if I may just very briefly conclude, uh, I would say that the treaties, uh, the, uh, the CHI, especially the sustainable development section of the CHI uh, actually uh, represents a new model of China's investment treaty uh, and recent paradigm shift of Chinese treaty. And despite the difficulty at this point of time, for the ratification of the treaty, the treaty itself 
stand as a good example. Uh, I, I believe to China and also to some other uh, developing countries and to uh, the uh, EU, it also provides a very good template for EU uh, in negotiating treaties uh, with countries uh, uh, like, like China uh, in the future. So with that, I, I, I think I would like to stop here and look forward to an engaging discussion. Thank you. Back to you, Brian. Great. Thanks, uh, Cliff, um, Professor Chu. Um, it's a really interesting uh, topic and, and certainly presentation. Um, at our first event, uh, I spoke on the CHI and I just briefly touched upon sustainable development. And so I'm glad you uh, were able to elaborate on it today. And I agree with you. I think this, uh, particularly for China, is really a, a paradigm shift uh, and a moment to say, yes, you know, we're comfortable including this in a provision, right? Not a side letter, but, but actually provisions in the, in the agreement. Um, and, you know, I think that um, uh, the European Commission uh, has taken a bit of a beating uh, from some activists uh, for saying that these provisions don't go strong enough. Um, but, you know, they're, 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 they're a lot better than nothing. And, um, you know, and, and the point I like to make is, is we can't uh, expect a trade or investment agreement to, uh, to you know, to, to control uh, environmentalism or, or, or sustainable development, right? It can only do a little. And I think this is a, a, a great place to start. Um, we'll hold off on, on, on questions, I think, until after uh, all of the speakers. I, I understand we're having some technical difficulties uh, with uh, Ambassador Keller and getting him uh, uh, online. And so uh, I think at this stage, we'll, we'll go straight to uh, my colleague, Professor Anatole Boot, uh, and we'll come back to uh, the Ambassador when, um, when the technical difficulties are, are resolved. And uh, Anatole will be speaking uh, uh, live uh, from our uh, Graduate Law Center in uh, in Admiralty in the center of, of Hong Kong. So Professor Boot, um, I understand you have slides and uh, hopefully they're being put up now. Yes, okay, we can see them. So I will turn it over to you. Okay, uh, wonderful, Brian, thanks a lot. And uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, can you put the full screen? Okay, so my topic uh, today is the EU uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism, also uh, known as CBAM, and its implications for China. And the argument uh, I will make is that the uh, relatively rigid approach that the EU Commission has taken in the design of this uh, mechanism um, could uh, prevent difficulties uh, for countries that have adopted other measures than carbon pricing. Um, and uh, that could actually result in disputes before the, the World Trade Organization. So I will use um, uh, some literature on unilateral uh, climate action and in fact, carbon imperialism to try to make sense of this uh, mechanism and try to kind of anticipate uh, where it can actually bring us in terms of um, tensions, both with World Trade Law, but also with international uh, climate law. So um, before I, I discuss the, um, the mechanism itself, I would like to uh, provide some uh, brief context. Uh, well, I, I mean, I'm starting here with the European Union. Uh, the European Union this year has adopted a climate neutrality target um, by 2050 and an intermediate target by 2030. Um, so, that uh, is uh, ambitious and uh, many uh, countries have been uh, followed uh, in, in a way uh, showing the, uh, perhaps the leadership of the European Union uh, in, this, uh, in international climate diplomacy. And I think this idea of leadership is important and I will come back to that uh, in a moment. So an important target here, uh, climate neutrality or, or net zero by 2050. Uh, so that actually <laughs> indeed involves uh, a, a radical transformation of the uh, industrial basis and uh, certainly also of uh, electricity generation. Now, how is the EU uh, planning to achieve that target? Well, in the, the main instrument, at least according to the policy, the main instrument is the emissions trading system, the ETS. 
And here again, the EU has uh, played a role as a leader. It has, I mean, followed uh, to some extent the, the, the US experience with uh, uh, environmental markets has adopted this mechanism and accumulated quite some experience and it's now being exported in many parts of the world, including China. So this trading system is the cornerstone of EU climate policy. Now, what does it consist of? In a nutshell, it uh, sets a cap, so essentially a maximum limit of emissions that can be uh, released by installations covered by the system. And then it requires every installation covered by the system to surrender uh, every year uh, carbon allowances that uh, essentially a number of carbon allowances that uh, corresponds to their emissions of greenhouse gases. Now, these carbon allowances, in principle, they have to be um, purchased on the market following the principle of auctioning. Now, as you can see on the graph here in front of you, uh, the prices have initially collapsed uh, in the first uh, phases of the scheme, this kind of pilot phase. And then uh, more recently, they've uh, essentially skyrocketed um, uh, following uh, the introduction of what is called the market stability uh, reserve, but also other interventions with the market. So European industry, uh, European electricity producers in the first place are exposed to this very high price. And um, so the general principle is auctioning. So industries have to buy the allowances on the, on the market at the market price. Now, there is, of course, an exception to that principle that's free allocation, and that applies at the moment to industries that are exposed to international competition, industries that are, that are exposed to the risk of carbon leakage. That means the risk of seeing their uh, essentially competitors taking over uh, market share because they don't have um, a carbon price in their um, uh, jurisdiction. Uh, uh, or seeing also installations actually being uh, moved away from the European Union and uh, being built uh, essentially in jurisdictions without carbon pricing. So to avoid that, the EU is giving out member states following EU rules is giving allowances for free to protect them from this international competition. But that is supposed to uh, be reduced gradually um, in order to essentially expose the industry to the, the price of carbon and accelerate the transition process. And it's clearly in this transition towards exposure to the carbon price that a carbon border adjustment mechanism is needed in order to level the playing field, in order to make sure that European producers don't suffer from uh, unequal competition from jurisdictions that don't have uh, such a high carbon price. So that's especially important in Europe because it's the world's largest carbon importer according to the Commission. That means that the European Union essentially imports a number of goods that are carbon that have been produced in a carbon intensive way. And so it's essentially indirectly responsible for all these emissions released outside of the European Union to a significant extent in China. And of course, you could say the European Union uh, then might feel responsible for that um, and might feel the need to actually act on that. Uh, perhaps in an you know extraterritorial way. So that's the European context: ambitious target, climate neutrality, a market-based mechanism with increasing prices that are uh, supposed now to 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 essentially also uh, be uh, up to apply to the industry, the, the manufacturers, and the EU importing a large quantity of carbon indirectly in its goods. So. What about the rest of the world? Well, as you can see from this map produced by the World Bank, carbon pricing is uh, implemented or, or adopted and about to be implemented or under consideration or planned in an increasing number of jurisdictions, actually in a significant number of jurisdictions uh, worldwide. So carbon pricing is essentially being extended, for instance, in China, but other parts of the world as well not just emission saving scheme, it can also be carbon taxes, uh, which are a bit more rigid, but also essentially impose a, a cost on the emissions of carbon. Now, let's zoom in on one of the important trading partners of the European Union, China, 
and let's try to see what you know the divergence that the, that there is between the EU carbon price and the carbon price in China. So China has a national scheme now, emission saving scheme, but uh, it's relatively recent and its scope is quite limited. And it has a number of pilot schemes, so-called pilot schemes at the provincial and city level. Now you can see, so they're on the bottom of the graph and that um, shows the fact that the price of carbon traded in China is actually absolutely not comparable uh, in, I mean, in order of magnitude lower than the European carbon price. So although China has an emission saving scheme, um, the price of carbon is of course much, much uh, lower. And that of course, from a competitiveness perspective is a significant uh, problem, significant issue. Now, China of course has a carbon neutrality target as well, 2060. China is a leader in many ways in terms of renewable energy um, investments and manufacturing of clean technology. In terms of carbon pricing, it's still lagging behind significantly with the European Union. So, what, so, so that creates, of course, a problem of competitiveness, as I mentioned, and also significant environmental issues clearly related to carbon leakage, the, the problem I, I introduced uh, a moment ago. So what does the European Union aim to do with this carbon border adjustment mechanism? Well, it aims to mirror the European emission trading schemes in, its, uh, in, in the imports of goods to essentially to apply in a way the emission trading scheme to imports was to protect uh, the domestic producers and extend essentially that carbon mechanism to uh, importers. So how does it work? Well, and it's just a proposal at the moment, uh, but it has support also from the parliament. Essentially authorized declarants have to submit a declaration uh, setting out the total embedded emissions of their imported goods. And then they have to indicate uh, how many CBAM certificates, so essentially how many allowances, carbon allowances, they have to surrender in order to uh, cover all their emissions. So we speak about here embedded emissions and more specifically, this concerns actual and direct emissions. So those involved in the production of goods. At the moment, uh, it doesn't include indirect emissions. That uh, means the emissions relating to, for instance, the supply of electricity to um, production sites. And that is despite actually an instruction or an indication in a, a resolution of the European Parliament, um, essentially meant, well, saying that indirect emissions should be part of the CBAM because clearly in Europe, the fact that electricity is covered in the ETS increases the cost of electricity for uh, manufacturers, and that creates a problem of competitiveness. So for all these embedded emissions, for, for, for a total corresponding to these embedded emissions, uh, importers have to submit CBAM certificates. These are essentially equivalent to carbon allowances, but only for these import uh, transactions. And so, of course, the importers have to pay a price for these allowances. That's the idea. And it's essentially the entire scheme is based on the fact that you're uh, requiring export, uh, importers to pay the carbon price. What price will the weekly average of the European emissions trading scheme? So, again, it's about, um, it's, it's about reflecting, mirroring the carbon price in the EU ETS on imports to level the playing field in domestic producers and importers. Now, very importantly, and that is essentially basically the key argument I'm, I'm going to focus on um, in the further explanation I will give, very importantly, the European Commission in its proposal uh, provides an exception or um, it says that importers, uh, so, so goods that have been produced in jurisdictions where a carbon price exists, well, that carbon price can be taken into account in the, essentially in the um, number of certificates to be submitted in, and in the price essentially to be paid. So you can essentially reduce your CBAM obligations as importer by taking into account the price of carbon already paid in the country of origin. Now, 
taking, uh, keep in mind that this uh, exception only applies to the price of carbon. So to essentially to carbon pricing instruments, no other measures are covered by this exception. So goods produced in jurisdictions where there is a carbon price, well, they uh, won't have to pay that price twice. The price paid in the country of origin can be taken into account in the European scheme. Okay, this might sound self-evident, but as I will explain in a moment, this generates quite some issues in particular, or including for China. So let me pause two seconds on the objectives produced with the CBAM. Well, the first objective obviously is environmental protection reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the context of this global urgency to uh, do something about climate change. And well, the ambition of the European Union is increasing. The European Union aims for carbon neutrality. And in parallel, it's intervening with the emissions trading scheme. The price of carbon is going up and it increases the pressure on European manufacturers. And that increases, of course, the risk of carbon leakage to so of industries that are exposed to international competition, suffering from competition by producers that don't have a carbon price. So the objective is to equalize the price of carbon between domestic producers and imports. And that's, that has an environmental objective, reduce emissions. Now you could say this perhaps is green protectionism. And indeed, the idea is to level the playing field but it's leveling the playing field. So it's, it's not essentially to protect European industries. It's more to, well, essentially avoid discrimination, avoid harming them from unfair competition from countries that don't do anything or don't do enough about carbon pricing, about climate change, at least in terms of carbon pricing. It's also about accelerating the decarbonization of the European Union production processes. Why? Well, because the CBAM will allow replacing free allocation, the free allocation of allowances with auctioning. Once there is CBAM and the risk of carbon leakage is mitigated, well, it will be possible to require all industries, all manufacturers, for instance, of carbon intensive goods to essentially buy their allowances, buy their carbon allowances on the market pay the, the price for carbon instead of receiving an allowance for free, which is the case at the moment. So by having the CBAM as a protection to carbon leakage, you're actually making it possible to expose the industry to auctioning. And that is supposed to, to accelerate decarbonization in Europe. It's also about incentivizing decarbonization abroad by, uh, in, by yes, essentially exposing importers to the carbon pricing or carbon prices the, the idea is that it will make it um, more, more important for them to reduce their carbon, carbon emissions that will increase their competitiveness because they will have to surrender less uh, carbon certificates. If they emit less CO2, they have, to emit le uh, they have to surrender less certificates. Now, very importantly, we could ask ourselves, yeah, what about the objective of exporting carbon pricing? Is that not also one of the objectives? And is CBAM not trying to do too much in terms of uh, objectives. Well, an important article published in the American Journal of International Law argues that CBAM in general can be a tool to exert political pressure on climate laggards as it can be used as a lever to induce climate action of trade partners. Now the European Union is a very important market and that puts the union in a unique position as a global standard setter so that's the idea of the European Union using its market power to force others to do something and to do what? Well, to adopt a carbon price. And, and, and that's quite uh, specific, isn't it? It's to essentially push third countries to adopt more stringent climate measures, more specifically, a carbon price. So what are the implications for China? Well, again, I'm coming back to that, I think, very important graph here from the International Carbon Action Partnership, uh, the freshest information on this huge gap of in pricing of carbon. I mean, the gap is significant, more than 60 euros in, in Europe and then less than, than 20 in China. That's a major gap 
for every ton of CO2 that has to be covered by China, by Chinese, uh, by imports of Chinese goods, at least, significantly uh, affecting the competitiveness of Chinese products um, in, in Europe, in particular, um, uh, compared to the, the, the situation at the moment. Now, what should China do? Should China just say, well, we continue our policy at the moment, we keep our emissions trading schemes as they are, we um, continue to operate with the prices as they are, we try to increase them gradually. Well, as a risk, if China, if that's the policy adopted by China, then importers of Chinese goods will have to pay that difference and that money will go to the EU budget. So there might be an argument for China to actually increase its carbon price so as to at least keep that money within China, avoid having the money being paid to the European Union budget, at least on the Chinese perspective. Um, so that's just a thought. Uh, the Russians, for instance, have as, as in reaction to that, and I'm sure they, they will consider other legal actions, for instance, before the World Trade Organization, the Russians are at the moment working on an emissions trading scheme in reaction possibly to that CBAM, so as to keep the money probably within their uh, jurisdiction. Now, all right, so that's about carbon pricing, but what about all other climate-related measures that China is implementing? And in an, arg in an article I published some years ago with my colleague, Professor Hao Zhang, we analyzed the role of the market and the role of direct regulation, traditional regulation, standards, performance standards, for instance, emission limits in China. And we argue that the market is only one part of the answer that Chinese, the Chinese government is proposing to transition to a low carbon economy. Direct regulation, traditional regulation, continues to be a very important tool for China to achieve its objective, just like it's a very important tool in many other jurisdictions. Now, these traditional regulatory measures are not part of the CBAM, they are not even considered in the CBAM. As I mentioned, the exception only takes into account carbon pricing. That means an emission trading scheme or a carbon tax, nothing else. Now, you might think that this is very rigid, very specific, very narrow. It essentially only looks at market mechanisms as only possible kind of climate mitigation tool. And indeed, a significant literature has been looking at EU climate change unilateralism, for instance, a, a very important article by um, Scott and Raj, Raja, Ravajani in the European Journal of International Law, but also the important book by Bradford on the Brussels effect and important political science arguments and publications on normative power Europe or normative empire Europe. All these uh, uh, publications to some extent look at the export of European rules. And in a way this can bring us to even previous publications on ecological imperialism, green imperialism, and now today carbon imperialism. Is that a bad thing? Well, clearly urgent action is needed and it's necessary for the European Union uh, probably, and it's good for the European Union to exercise leadership, but at the same time, by being very narrow and rigid in the measures it's accepting as uh, in its exception, uh, it uh, probably is uh, exercising at least some form of uh, unilateralism. And that doesn't fit well with World Trade Law. And that potentially could raise I would think or possibly anticipate some issues under the general agreement on trade and tariffs, Article 20 on the exceptions, if it is considered to be a, a violation of national treatment or other provisions, then it could be justified under Article 20. But here, uh, as many of you will know, the, the, the appellate body is quite specific in uh, the fact that a, a country cannot impose on third countries essentially the same comprehensive regulatory program. So is it okay for the European Union to require other countries to have carbon pricing in order to avoid paying the CBAM certificate price? Is that not too rigid? There is, according to the jurisprudence by the upper body, a need for flexibility to take into account the specific conditions prevailing in exporting members. Is that integrated in the CBAM proposal, is there enough flexibility? Is only limiting the exception to carbon pricing not too rigid? And I would say 
in a, in a proposal of CBAM mechanism in the United States, uh, a broader approach is taken, measures equivalent uh, are uh, considered, and that would also possibly include direct regulation. Is that rigidity compatible with the Paris Agreement, international climate law? Well, there is this important principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. And we could wonder whether requiring all countries, even developing economies, uh, to um, treating them in, an, in a similar way, applying the CBAM to all of them, whether that is not a, a breach of carbon, of this common but differentiated responsibility principle, taking into account that developing countries are in many cases more carbon intensive, they are less likely to have carbon pricing, their institutional framework might make it more difficult to have carbon pricing, yet they are treated equally. Is that okay under international climate law? The Paris Agreement explicitly re re recognizes the importance of non-market approaches um, to achieve climate change mitigation. Well, the European Union here does exactly the opposite. It's only focusing on carbon pricing, essentially on market-based approaches. So that's um, essentially what I want to um, present today. And I'm looking forward to your feedback and comments or questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor Boot. Um, much food for thought in there. A few issues I want to uh, press you on, and uh, I may do so uh, after the uh, the two speakers um, conclude. I think that last point about uh, differentiated uh, responsibilities is quite an important one as well, and goes to the kind of the, the heart of what you're talking about. If the main objective is uh, reduction of carbon then on the one hand it shouldn't matter um, if you if you give a break to, to a country that is responsible for what half the the carbon emissions uh, the goal is of course reduced um, on the other hand uh, there are equity issues um, okay I understand the technical difficulties um, with ambassador uh, Keller's um, have been resolved and that, um, that uh, he has now joined us. So I am, uh, it is my, my pleasure to invite him uh, to present. Ambassador Keller, are you there to speak on sustainability in EU-China relations? Yes, yes, I am here, Perfect. thanks. And uh, thank you for your patience too. And uh, the technical issues are resolved. So I hope, um, I hope everything is okay now, and thank you again. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation to, uh, to this very um, important and interesting seminar. Let me, if I may, just make clear that I am, I'm not a, a climate expert or a legal expert. Um, I was permanent representative of Ireland to the European Union for seven years. So I'm essentially a negotiator. I was a negotiator. And before that, I was ambassador in China also for a number of years. So let me take that as the starting point. And I think it is important um, as we look at this and we look at the scope for cooperation between the EU and China on this, just to recall that the, the relationship between the EU and China has gone through several phases. The comprehensive strategic partnership uh, has existed since 2003, when both China and the European Union were very different. Now, both sides, of course, have recast their strategies since then, but the pace and the scale of change does require not only constant analysis and review, but constant treatment at the political level, both to enhance mutual understanding and avoid mistrust and miscalculations. So very briefly, and as I'm sure you're all aware, China has gone through unprecedented changes since 2003, um, and uh, its membership of the WTO shortly before that, its successful hosting of the Beijing Olympics, the global financial crisis in the West, the growing uh, presence of China in the UN, uh, and more vocal approach in the UN Security Council in particular, and the Belt and Road Initiative, are just some of the high level examples of 
of how things have changed. As well as that, China is going, has been going through a fundamental recasting of its industrial policy. But it is important to recall that the European Union has also changed enormously since 2003. It has nearly doubled in size with the accession of 13 states. Uh, it has developed economic and monetary union. It survived the global financial crisis of 2008 and established banking union. It's and it has played and is playing a leading role in both meeting the challenges of the pandemic and meeting the challenges of climate change and dealing with a more complex geopolitical situation. I should also recall, and here I'm happy to see so many lawyers online, that the European Union is a unique experiment in international affairs. It's a democratic and law-based collectivity that pools sovereignty among the 27 sovereign member states. And of course, a number of other states do wish to join, notwithstanding that one is left uh, in the form of the UK on Brexit. But I think that's a very, very, uh, unusual and unique situation. So the EU and China, by virtue of their roles as global actors of the first importance, are seeking to find a way to manage and advance this complex and multifaceted relationship. And against, as I said, the geopolitical problems and declining support for multilateralism, in effect, can be frank, um, a kind of the Chinese understanding of multilateralism and the European Union understanding of multilateralism are not quite aligned, are not quite the same. Um, I think also that the age of the, uh, the, the, uh, the post-World War II multilateral order is showing its age a bit, and obviously that's something that uh, is in need of reform. But um, partly because, and indeed anticipating some of these changes, and partly because the balance had shifted between the European Union and China, the EU adopted a new strategic approach in 2019. And I think this is important because it's often misunderstood. So let me just briefly summarize it. China for the EU is simultaneously in different policy areas, a cooperation partner with whom the EU has closely aligned objectives a negotiating partner with whom the EU needs to find a balance of interests, an economic competitor in the pursuit of technological leadership and a systemic rival provide, promoting alternative models of governance. This requires a flexible and pragmatic whole of EU approach, enabling a principled defense of interests and values. Now, the first part of that, I think, is what we're going to be talking about today, the partnership, particularly on the whole question of sustainability and climate. Let me add that the third element, the EU uh, saying that um, that you and China are systemic rivals in some areas is something I'm sure you know that the Chinese government is not happy with. They prefer the EU not say that. But there are governance issues. There are issues relating to uh, overall approaches to issues such as democracy and human rights, which um, are uh, points of difference and which uh, can only benefit by frankness and by trying to address those differences. And let me also just say that this statement of 2019 did not appear out of the ether. It actually was the um, accompaniment to a proposal for 10 key actions by the EU. Um, one of which I should say is to call on China to peak its emissions before 2030 in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Now, China has done that. I'm not saying it's done that because of the EU strategy, but I think it just shows, it illustrates the point I mentioned about alignment on these, uh, these um, kind of high level global goods areas. And as well as that, I do want to emphasize that the EU's approach is a constructive platform for building practical and mutually beneficial outcomes. It is not, code or it is not a device to contain China, still less a device to isolate China. That is not part of the European Union's approach at all. So let me talk briefly about the scope for partnership and sustainability. And there the European Union um, starts from the Green Deal, which is a massively transformative um, approach within the EU. It is something which is intended to give both a direction and a basis 
for a climate neutral world by 2050, uh, certainly uh, EU being climate neutral by 2050, um, China says 2060, but the key thing is we have to move forward. And this is affecting every part of what the European Union does. So the, uh, the basis for a competitive economy, a carbon friendly competitive economy is underway. And of course, just transition, there will have to be compensation, there will have to be um, a quite a sophisticated set of readjustments there. And this covers energy, it covers mobility, it covers food systems, and of course the circular economy. The other point is that this requires vast resources. So 30% of the European Union's budget over the next seven year period will be devoted to this. And also it will affect every aspect of EU regulation, um, policy and investment formulation, uh, and also EU rules and standards, which as, as the previous speaker said, the Brussels effect exists. And this, this will undoubtedly influence global market developments. So the EU is a directional leader in climate action and wants to engage China. There has been progress. I mean, going right back 16 years, there was the start of the EU-China uh, cooperation on climate change. Uh, just uh, last year, there was the high level environment and climate dialogue. But um, some practical issues, excuse me, are issues that need to be uh, the subject of more effort and work. Number one is, and the, the previous speaker spoke about this, the emission trading uh, scheme. There is cooperation here between the EU and China. China's ETS is different and more limited in scope. Um, and it does not, it seems to the EU to entail economy-wide emission reductions. But uh, closer alignment is something which would be a positive thing between the European Union and China on that. Secondly, let me refer to CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. Um, I think the previous speaker set this out very clearly. Uh, it is controversial, even within the European Union is controversial, and it does have to meet WTO uh, standards. It has to be WTO compatible. But there again, um, that's something that the European Union can work with China on. And let me come back to the WTO angle in a few moments. Um, another element is the promotion of healthy ecosystems. And here China has a particularly high profile by virtue of COP15 in Kunming and biodiversity. And this is something that the European Union wants to enhance its cooperation on. Uh, circular economy is something where the EU has put a great deal of effort into. Um, and um, the EU's uh, circular economy action plan specifically emphasizes the importance of action at the global level. Now, frankly, the European Union is not doing too well in managing its own waste, uh, but uh, there have been useful cooperation and has been useful cooperation with China on the whole question of plastics. Um, and of course, uh, supply chains need to be greened. Um, on China's role, let me just let me just digress and just recall something. I think um, the previous speaker also spoke to voluntary uh, differentiated policies. I was in Beijing at the time of the Copenhagen COP, which of course ended in um, less than full agreement, if I can put it like that. And I was speaking to the chief Chinese negotiator the day after he returned to Beijing. Um, and in a sense, you know, some of the broad aspects of the Chinese approach have remained unchanged, that uh, China took a voluntary approach, China was a big developing country, China was not to blame for what had been um, done over the last 300 years, this was something for the developed countries, and also the point was made that there is a qualitative difference between a Chinese farmer struggling to make a living and a kind of somebody in a Western air conditioned gym. Now, um, I'm not going to comment on the validity or otherwise of those remarks. Some of those are still heard, but I think what is interesting is while that there was political disappointment over the recent Glasgow COP, um, there are some, I think, encouraging factors. There is, I think, little doubt that in the 12 months since President Xi Jinping set out uh, his um, carbon objectives at the UN General Assembly. 
um, a number of fast moving domestic policies have been launched and set in train in China. Um, and it also seems to be the case that a number of these policies, particularly geared towards the carbon neutral goal of 2060, are being front loaded. I hear, I don't know whether it's true or not, that there is a sense that uh, peak cement in China will be as soon as 2025 and peak steel not long afterwards. Uh, there are also synergies with other pre-existing Chinese policies, the so-called beautiful China environmental cleanup policy. And I think it's also worth recalling again, and it's the reason why I mentioned uh, things that happened in the early 2000s, that even at a time when Chinese growth was running at 15% annually, back in 2007, the, the then Premier of the State Council, uh, Wen Jiabao, um, said to the National People's Congress that um, the Chinese economy uh, had four uns, as they were called. It was unbalanced, unsustainable, unstable, and uncoordinated. And even then there was uh, a proposal to change that structure, which I think was delayed probably because of the global financial crisis in the West. And we had the fiscal stimulus in China, which also caused its own problems. But I think now um, we need looking on the positive side, just to be aware that there are green technology industrial approaches, uh, which on the face of it um, in China fit very well with not only China's uh, restructuring of its industrial policy, but also what the European Union is trying to do. We don't hear that much anymore about so-called made in China 2025 policy, but the thrust seems to be still there. So there is a kind of paradox, if I can put it like this, that um, you know, China unusually seems at one level to be under-promising, but another level, there seems to be scope that it may over deliver. Now we will see, I don't have a crystal ball, but it's just a thought to inject into this discussion today. Um, let me briefly, because I'm conscious of time, talk a little bit about investment. Um, one aspect that became quite controversial at the start of this year was the comprehensive investment agreement, which was agreed between um, the uh, European Union and China, uh, subject to approval by the European Parliament. Um, there's no doubt that that is stuck politically uh, and it's controversial. Uh, it received criticism um, because it was seen by some as giving little new market access to China and simply a kind of um, recording unilateral uh, positions that China had already made. Secondly, um, it was seen as not addressing human rights issues. And third, the timing also uh, was seen as slightly controversial in the sense that it took place during the interregnum between the Trump and the Biden administrations in the US. Um, however, it's stuck, as I say, because the EU-China relationship in some areas has become more complicated. There have been sanctions and counter sanctions, but I think it's worthwhile recalling that it does have a number of positive elements. It includes obligations on market access, most favored nation treatment, and a list of prohibited performance requirements, such as export obligations and local content requirements. And it also is quite specific on uh, the status of state-owned enterprises, which has been something of um, uh, a difficult issue in the EU over the last couple of years. And I think it's important not to forget that it is, it does have a chapter on sustainability. So there is an argument that the CAI should be looked at in a broader context of EU, US, China trade and investment relationships. Um, it has provisions that go beyond the WTO agreements and even beyond the China WTO accession protocol. Now, I don't want to overstate this, uh, but I think it's worthwhile bearing this in mind at a time when investment and trade aspects uh, globally are becoming more complicated. And there, let me say that the European Union has uh, adopted some generally facing new trade defense instruments, investment screening regulation, um, uh, anti-coercion instruments, uh, for example. Um, just to come to the end of what I want to say now with a few thoughts 
for the future. Um, one is that um, there's evidence that the European Union and China um, are aligning, as I say, on environmental sustainability, which I think would be a plus in the WTO framework. I mentioned earlier cooperation on plastics and also a China EU cooperation about plastics and fossil fuel. On sea bands, um, I think there's no doubt that China is worried at the Green Steel Initiative that the European Union and US uh, agreed um, some time ago. But I think there, uh, the important thing is if sea bands are to work, they have to be taken at face value. And certainly the European Union would very much want China to come on board on that. Uh, I think also if I can put a slightly different focus on it, um, the United States could benefit from some of the aspects of the CAI, um, particularly sustainability being baked into the um, investment agreement. And, uh, you know, I don't see that there would be an argument against multilateralizing that kind of approach. Um, and um, I think EU-China relationships, and particularly in the investment area, do have a lot of potential. And finally, investment requires resources and funding. We have not only the um, approach taken at COP um, that Mark Carney is in uh, presiding over, but I do think it worthwhile just recalling that the EU and China have been working quite well in relation to the International Platform of Sustainable Finance, which was launched in 2019. And the EU and China have released uh, a report on a common ground taxonomy, which essentially is trying to align the kind of analytical and other policy tools, uh, the sectors, the scope, transition considerations, etc. No, none of this, of course, is in the final analysis legally binding, but it is important. And when we talk about EU China, I think it's important not to forget the broader Asian context. And I think it is noteworthy that a number of Asian uh, countries, um, India, uh, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, SAR, um, have all, if you like, joined the international platform on sustainable finance. So um, the aim of that is to scale up mobilization of private capital. And I think there's no doubt that the mainstreaming of um, the green agenda into corporate um, uh, planning is very, very noticeable. And I think that's also something that the EU-China relationship on sustainability should uh, take into account. Um, thanks, and I'll hand back to you. Excellent. Thank you uh, for that um, uh, very informative uh, talk. And I like how you summarized at, at the end. I'll just you know, mention uh, one thing. I, I, I in particular uh, like how you mentioned the, the recent uh, agreement between the US and, and European Union on, on steel. Um, you know, this I think we can see as, as part of, uh, again, this movement towards uh, green initiatives, but also I think the move towards towards managed trade, and uh, and uh, I'm not sure if 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 it's desirable, but perhaps we're going to see this, uh, you know, maybe Japan come in at at, at some point, um, and it being used as a bit of a counter towards towards China as well. As a trade lawyer, I have to say as well that um, when you mentioned, you know, that China used to be used to have a growth rate of of fifteen percent. Um, and now, you know, maybe it's gone down to 6% for, for quite some time. I think one of the issues, though, was, of course, the, the steel production facilities, the cement manufacturing remained at the level it was uh, when, when China was growing 15%. Uh, it didn't decline with it. I mean, from a trade perspective, that's when we saw lots of the dumping actions being taken against uh, China, because for the first time, China was, was really exporting in large numbers. Um, at, at, at cheap prices. Uh, so it, it not only had that uh, environmental effect, but I'm glad you also hit on the, the point of maybe China is under promising internationally, but actually delivering. Because as we know, you know, it is really now uh, a leader in developing renewable energy, uh, not, not only finished products, which, which we know, but also technologies and will be for the future. So I do wonder if um, just through 
natural attrition, we will see a reduction of the cement and steel, et cetera, and these um, high carbon emission uh, industries. Uh, we'll go straight to the next speaker, so we'll come back for questions um, at the end. So for time, uh, let's go to um, uh, Zheng Jingjing, uh, who is joining us um, I, from the United States at a very early time in the morning. So uh, thank you, Ms. Zheng, for being here uh, at this um, at this time and for uh, participating in the seminar. Thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to this event. And um, uh, even though I'm a yeah, little bit tired uh, after uh, 20 days uh, uh, field trip to West Africa and uh, uh, looked at the Chinese uh, overseas investment in the mining sector in West Africa and on the their uh, the biodiversity and the climate impact and uh, but I do have some uh, on the cases would like to share with uh, audience and, uh, and as well as other speakers. Uh, so I am an uh, environment lawyer and I think. Uh, uh, I will uh, bring a more uh, practical perspective and look at uh, three cases. And uh, I will also bring a uh, uh, subject of uh, 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 international human rights law to the conversation because uh, um, it, my work uh, is in uh, the intersection of the uh, international investment law and uh, international uh, uh, human rights and uh, environment laws. So I'd like to share uh, some cases I have been uh, doing and uh, I'm not expert on the China EU or uh, EU uh, law and I, my um, uh, expertise is on the Chinese investment and its uh, environment impact. I, I used to be an environment litigator. I worked for uh, China's first environment law clinic and uh, uh, Center for um, Legal um, Assistance to Pollution Victims and uh, CUPL, China um, University of Political Science and Law. And I, I had uh, quite a lot of uh, um, um, pollution uh, cost tort cases uh, starting from 1999 and to 2008. And so I'm uh, now working on the uh, cases. Um, my case is mostly in the developing country, uh, Chinese overseas uh, recipient countries in global south, not in uh, EU per se, but I do have a case uh, I had uh, in Bosnia. So the start to share with you. Uh, so first I would like, uh, Give a very brief uh, practical introduction of the um, the China's um, outbound in the direct investment, the governance structure, uh, regulation, and the accountability mechanism. And I list uh, the major uh, government departments or ministers uh, with, with mandate uh, to regulate and manage uh, China's outbound investment. And um, the most important. Uh, Two, you may know, is the National Development and Reform Commission, NDRC, and the Minister of the Commerce, MOFCOM. And I also need, uh, list are the you know, relatively new agency, China International Cooperation and Development Agency, uh, which in charge China's uh, uh, foreign uh, aid uh, project. And other uh, the government uh, um, agencies include like the uh, 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 the state administration for the foreign exchange and uh, China Bank and the Insurance Regulatory Commission, they all have a uh, uh, certain uh, mandate to regulate and manage uh, China's outbound investment. Um, but I want to point out the government, um, the Minister of uh, uh, Ecology and the Environment, does not have a mandate. Uh, to regulate and uh, to manage uh, uh, China's uh, outbound in, uh, direct investment. And this is a mis, uh, uh, common misunderstanding uh, uh, by many uh, uh, China observers or uh, international uh, law, uh, NGOs. And uh, they thought uh, the Minister of the Ecology and the Environment has a mandate and uh, um, to uh, screen uh, China's overseas investment project, but it, does not. And uh, 
um, Chinese environment laws uh, uh, do not regulate outbound investment. Uh, it's very clearly expressed in the environment protection law and uh, environment impact assessment law. Those uh, laws are only on uh, uh, compliance and uh, uh, regulate um, and manage the environment matters uh, within China's uh, territories. And we do not have this overarching uh, laws on the um, uh, outbound investment, uh, uh, though we, uh, we, we have a, quite a lot of the measures, uh, minister level uh, regulations on the, on, uh, the, the outbound investment um, management and um, most uh, of the uh, measures are made by the MOFCOM and uh, NDRC and the uh, uh, very recent uh, the measures for the administration for foreign aid was uh, made by the CICDA uh, that is on the uh, foreign aid uh, project um, and we um, have a one article in the criminal uh, law uh, regulate uh, the um, bribing uh, the foreign government and the international organization crime. And uh, th this article has never been uh, used. And uh, even though there are a lot of uh, uh, we call it rumors or um, report on the Chinese um, uh, companies um, uh, for bribing on the, on the the foreign uh, government um, uh, uh, or public servant um, uh, issues, um, but we, uh, we didn't see any cases has been prosecuted uh, by using this article. And talking about the accountability, accountability, this is what I have been uh, doing. Uh, if Chinese um, overseas investment uh, or Chinese um, company caused environment human rights uh, violation, uh, beyond China's borders, namely in those uh, Chinese overseas uh, investment or aid project recipient countries, uh, can the community or um, the people suffered, uh, people's rights have affected, uh, can they file um, a litigation in, uh, within uh, China and uh, to pursue the, uh, the compensation, to request compensation and hold the Chinese company accountable um, and the, the answer is um, um, no, uh, not yet. We didn't see any cases has been uh, filed and uh, Chinese uh, court uh, regarding uh, the uh, Chinese companies um, um, overseeing investment costs, human rights and environment uh, um, violations. And uh, there are many um, uh, uh, legal obstacles uh, include procedural level and uh, uh, substantial uh, level, and uh, I won't uh, go further, but uh, uh, we didn't see any cases yet, but uh, internationally in other uh, con uh, country, in other jurisdictions, we we did uh, see um, this is a trend uh, in EU or in uh, EU countries and in UK, there are cases have been filed by um, uh, NGOs or by the Community uh, themselves supported by NGOs and to uh, to seek the compensation on those uh, EU and UK based multinationals. And I think the most well known case uh, is a shell case you know, uh, filed in both in uh, Netherlands and the UK. And uh, um, the case in Netherlands has been. Uh, uh, the verdict has been made and the community um, uh, uh, issued uh, composition. So that is a, a very good uh, cases uh, for me to look at how we, I can pursue the same uh, legal avenues and legal uh, techniques and to hold Chinese uh, company accountable in uh, the home countries. And uh, in US, you, um, we saw the alien tort case uh, some years ago, but the, that uh, that case that avenue has been blocked uh, um, uh, in 2017. Um, 
But uh, overall, we see this trend uh, to hold uh, multinationals uh, accountable uh, beyond one country, one jurisdiction uh, borders. And uh, um, we are seeing this new treaty, the uh, UN uh, Human Rights Treaty regarding the transnational cooperation and other business uh, enterprise uh, respect to human rights. And uh, um, I hope this, uh, this treaty, binding treaty can be the overarching uh, legal instrument, international legal instrument for uh, us and uh, NGOs and for communities and to hold uh, multinational, in include uh, multinational from China accountable for their violation, human rights environment violations uh, beyond one country's border. And then I would like to uh, introduce three cases and because we are talking about the China and the EU. And so I specifically choose the case in Europe and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, three cases and uh, all of them happen in the Balkan uh, region. And uh, the case uh, the Tuznak coal plant uh, in Bosnia and uh, uh, Kosnak uh, case in um, uh, uh, in uh, Serbia and uh, the Zijin uh, uh, copper mine in uh, Serbia. And uh, the two coal plant case, Tusna 7 and uh, Kosna uh, uh, B3, um, both uh, uh, in, um, have shared a lot of things in common. Uh, both cases, both projects then financed by uh, China export and import uh, back and uh, uh, the contract EPC contracts are Chinese companies and uh, uh, both cases both uh, have been um, um, challenged and uh, and to the energy community boards and which is a regional uh, treaty and mechanism and uh, but the difference between these two uh, coal plants is one Serb uh, one is a uh, EU member country another is not um, Serbia is a EU member country and uh, so EU uh, regulations strict uh, uh, emission uh, regulation apply to Serbia uh, and while the Bosnia is not uh, the EU uh, member country yet and so uh, it on, uh, only um, the, the coal plants uh, will comply with uh, the Bosnia national standard. So, uh, the case of uh, Tuzna 7 coal uh, plants, uh, this case I have been uh, participant uh, directly. Um, the uh, local NGOs uh, filed uh, a lawsuit to challenge um, the, the coal plants, uh, yeah, environment impact assessment, and uh, the case was rejected by the local court. And then the, uh, the NGO filed the complaint and the energy um, board uh, challenge uh, on this um, uh, lending process or burning process violates uh, the energy community's uh, state aid rules. Both cases um, have been challenged on this same uh, ground. It's an illegal state aid um, um, practice uh, by the host country, Serbia and uh, Bosnia. And uh, when I was uh, visiting there and the major issues around the coal nash, uh, the uh, coal uh, disposal uh, sites and uh, it uh, caused uh, the groundwater uh, pollution and uh, the uh, air pollution. And so the you know, uh, community uh, uh, filed uh, on the litigation and the local court and um, uh, there are uh, sorts of uh, quite a lot of issue around the on the pollution, not on the um, CO2 emission uh, ground, uh, not the uh, climate uh, ground, uh, but on the uh, air pollution and uh, water pollution ground. So that is a, a case, the, the significance of this case is uh, after exhausting uh, the uh, local uh, domestic uh, legal remedies and uh, community and NGO in Bosnia, uh, five to two use the, uh, um, the regional um, mechanics. One, they filed a, a communication request and office convention. And second, they, they filed the communication uh, request uh, to the UN Human Rights Special Procedures. And uh, they filed the complaint to the UN Special Rapporteur on the 
an environment and human rights. And, uh, and they also filed another uh, communication request to the, the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on the toxide, uh, toxic waste and uh, human rights. And uh, let me see. So here is uh, the um, uh, China's official response uh, to this request. Uh, um, using this uh, mechanism, UN special uh, procedure uh, include uh, uh, this uh, UN special rapporteur um, that um, uh, give uh, the community and the NGO uh, opportunity to directly communicate with uh, Chinese uh, government official. Here is uh, China's uh, permanent mission of the, to uh, Geneva. And from these documents, you can see, and uh, uh, there's uh, um, 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 some reasoning and uh, evidence uh, listed by um, Chinese uh, government and the delegation uh, to Geneva, and um, that this procedure has uh, reached uh, its end, and uh, it's a communication uh, request. It won't lead to any binding. And um, decision, but uh, it provides a communication channel for the affected community, affected by the Chinese uh, coal plants, financed coal plants, and uh, the Chinese government. And so that is uh, one case. And uh, in this uh, procedure, in this process, I wrote uh, uh, support uh, an opinion to. Um, to support the local community and NGO uh, fire such a, a communication a request to the UN uh, Special Rapporteur. So this is one case. And this is a second uh, a case, uh, Kosnas uh, coal plant, the same like the, uh, the one I mentioned in the Bosnia case and uh, uh, Chinese um, uh, exports uh, and import back is a fin financial and uh, 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 Chinese company is the uh, EPC uh, uh, contractor, and uh, the two cases share a lot of things in common. And in this case, a similar uh, issue is about air pollution, the SO2 pollution, and uh, a land issue. And you look at this community, this house, uh, just outside the, the coal uh, plants, and uh, there are uh, a lot of noise and uh, uh, vibration and other uh, pollution issue. And uh, so that uh, the similar uh, petition has been submitted to the uh, energy uh, community board. And I would like to mention that most people may not know the energy community is an, uh, is an international organization which brings together to the EU, EU and its neighbors to create this integrated pan-European energy market. The organization was funded by by the treaty established the energy commu community signed in uh, 2005. And uh, the key objective of the energy community is to extend the EU uh, internal energy market rules and principles to countries in the Southeast Europe and the Black Sea region and beyond uh, and on the basis of the uh, legal binding framework. So that uh, energy uh, community uh, um, provide this uh, uh, petition and the grooming mechanism for community to submit petition. Uh, this is what I especially want to uh, in introduce and uh, energy board. Um, so the last case is uh, not a coal plant uh, case, not, but it's also uh, on the Chinese uh, investment and uh, uh, air pollution. Uh, Zijin is a private uh, Chinese company published uh, the uh, uh, public uh, treated on, on Shanghai and the Hong Kong stock exchange, and uh, uh, it has been expanding uh, to uh, many uh, 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 countries. And uh, in uh, Serbia, uh, it invested in, uh, in this um, uh, coal uh, mining and the smelter uh, site, and uh, it caused a severe CO2 um, um, pollution. And the city of the board uh, filed a, a criminal complaint uh, very recently. And Zijin is a, a company with 
uh, uh, quite notorious environment uh, performance in China. And uh, um, while, while I was still in China, and in uh, Zijin had uh, a tenor, uh, many tenor dam clubs in 2010, and it uh, the then Minister of the uh, Environment Protection uh, made the um, the highest uh, um, fine on the Zijin that was in 2000 about nine million RMB uh, penalty on this uh, dam collapse and it killed uh, 22 people. And Zijin uh, expands uh, very uh, quickly and uh, it has a, a, a gold mine in PNG, which has very bad human rights uh, um, violation record. And it has the uh, uh, real Blanca copper in Peru. What I uh, may want to mention this case is uh, um, Zijin, um, all this um, uh, its subsidiaries uh, environment the human rights violation has not been uh, have not been uh, reported in its um, the corporate uh, uh, report. Uh, if you look at this uh, annual report and the ESG report, uh, it's nothing about uh, there. All those uh, the, the violations, environment performance, and uh, human rights violation or cases, uh, litigation cases, and uh, were not mentioned in the uh, Zijin's uh, uh, annual report, and that brought issues how uh, Chinese uh, uh, overseas company should, uh, if at all, how it should uh, 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 disclose uh, their subsidiaries uh, and environment performance beyond China's border. So that is, uh, um, I think, the, uh, the, the um, issue I've like uh, addressed and uh, still working on it. And uh, um, but so far we didn't see uh, the the information has been uh, properly disclosed to the general public and uh, to shareholders. So that uh, this is my last case, and uh, I hope uh, the three cases uh, can provide. Uh, 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 different pers perspectives uh, uh, for you to think about uh, Chinese, uh, 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 China EU relations and uh, Chinese overseas um, investment and uh, environment and climate impact. So that is my talk. I'm too happy to answer the questions. Great, thank you, Ms. Zhang. Um, you know, it's my um, understanding, I think China just recently uh, joined a host of other countries in stating that it would not support uh, coal, uh, uh, the, the, the building of coal plants overseas. Uh, I mean, a couple of questions there. Shortly thereafter, I think a, a large project that was to be funded by a Chinese bank in Zimbabwe collapsed. Um, I, there were many, many problems with that, but it did collapse. Um, but I think it's very interesting because, of course, those pledges don't um, really hold private banks to account. But I think the question in China would be, does it hold state-owned enterprises into account? Are state-owned enterprises uh, going to still invest in coal uh, production, or are they also going to abide uh, by, the, by the pledge? Um, maybe you can just think about that now, and we'll come back to you. Uh, we have, um, we are um, fairly over time here. So uh, our commentator, is uh, is uh, Dini Sacco, the research associate at the center. Dini, if I can ask you to maybe um, be be slightly um, brief with the comments, so that we can we can get to some questions. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers for the very thorough uh, presentation, and uh, you know uh, one of the reasons uh, to act discussing this issue is, uh, is first of all the Belt and Road Initiative. So many of the uh, Chinese companies have uh, seen uh, great support to, to invest in, in, different, in different jurisdictions uh, in Europe, as uh, we just saw with the cases uh, presented by Professor Zhang, but also elsewhere. So one of the issues that uh, come to mind is uh, uh, sh should we, uh, when we look at the responsibility of Chinese companies, uh, uh, hold responsible the host countries or the companies themselves. So uh, in some of the jurisdictions that I have done field work research myself, 
uh, especially, uh, which is not the case of Europe. I, I was doing research in Southeast Asia. And in this jurisdiction, uh, the local legislation did allow uh, Chinese companies to, to invest in, uh, in, uh, in projects, especially uh, coal-fired uh, power plants that uh, are uh, not up to, up to standard. So uh, to some extent, this also affected the, uh, uh, the reputation of Chinese investments ab uh, abroad uh, that and, land, uh, and uh, led to uh, the 2019 BRI Forum and the declaration of the Chinese president for a more sustainable uh, B, uh, BRI. So the, the first question that I uh, would like to, uh, the speakers to address, and maybe um, mainly uh, Professor Zhang Xunxi has uh, direct experience with, the, uh, with the issues, is uh, uh, should uh, we expect more to be done by uh, the host uh, countries than from Chinese enterprises, which eventually are enterprises. So if, a, if it is not a Chinese enterprise that is making that polluting investments, then it will be another enterprise from another country or an, a, a local SOE of, uh, of the host country. Uh, the, the second question uh, regards uh, still the BRI forum, uh, and it's mainly addressed also this one to uh, Professor uh, Zhang. Uh, do we see uh, a change of approach in the, in the type of investments that have taken place after the declarations in 2000? Uh, in 2019, and uh, of course, the the BRI itself uh, came together with a host of institutions. It, uh, do these institutions behave differently? For example, it is clear that uh, AAIB, which is not a purely BRI institution, but it was established in the same in the same period, uh, it has it has and it applies higher standards in in its projects. Why aren't other uh, Chinese development banks? Uh, w why cannot they uh, follow the example of the AIB? And uh, now I'll shift uh, to uh, the uh, more uh, EU-related issues. And uh, so, as it was mentioned uh, several times, now we are uh, we are shifting towards uh, unilateralism, even though uh, uh, last year this time uh, during this time. EU and China concluded the Comprehensive Agreement on Investments with a very, uh, uh, with a innovative, to some extent, innovative approach to uh, sustain, uh, sustainability, as uh, it was also discussed uh, by Professor Cho at the beginning. Uh, now we see a, a greater attention uh, towards uh, uh, unilateral uh, decisions, sanctions on one hand. So EU and China are uh, falling into the, uh, the sanction trap. And there have been examples before that sanctions are not always uh, really helpful to, uh, to achieve their objective, but only exacerbate the relationship between, uh, between the, two, the two partners. So uh, in this uh, case, uh, wouldn't be more fruitful for uh, EU to engage China in uh, the in further negotiation of sustainability provisions uh, and uh, their implementation rather than uh, uh, pursue the same objectives by, uh, by issuing sanctions or uh, by uh, developing uh, unilateral uh, uh, legislative uh, instruments such as CBAM discussed by uh, Professor uh, Booth. So these are my uh, comments and I give the floor to the speakers to address. Great. Why don't I, um, <laughs> I hope you have a pen. Why don't I throw a few more of the questions that were, that were asked uh, and that I have out there and then we'll really only have time for one round I think from each, each speaker and maybe, maybe to summarize. Uh, a question for Professor Boot. Uh, you had a a slide about the which you referred to twice about the um, the price of carbon and and you know it, it looked like in Shenzhen and Fujian maybe the price was was near zero uh, but certainly the EU price was was higher but given that a lot of the EU permits were given away as opposed to to purchased um, is is that actually a fair price or is it is it a distorted number um, and or does it take account for the fact 
that they were given away. So it does seem in, in some ways that that number could be uh, inflating the actual price um, by just looking at the price uh, that, that, that's traded now. Um, I, I would like others uh, actually to comment also on the uh, on the the reason for the CBAM and 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 Professor Boot listed a, a few different reasons. Um, I mean, but in particular, whether you think this will become a new baseline or a new standard um, from which others will uh, cost and reduce uh, carbon. Um, a question um, that uh, some of you are well placed to. Uh, to answer was actually just, is there a cooperation? And I suspect this probably means private, but also public uh, cooperation in the fields of, of shared development of things such as hydrogen technology, uh, you know, waste recycling, et cetera, between the EU and China. Uh, so we talk about these macro agreements all the time, but at the micro level, um, are initiatives taking place um, and and maybe a final question I'll ask here, which uh, Professor Chu, you are well um, um, versed in. It's a question. It maybe takes it the opposite approach, which is how best to address and protect investments abroad um, through the Energy Charter Treaty or moving to new investment treaties. And and I guess a corollary to that is um, how do you deal with the the goals of uh, bilateral investment treaties, you know, energy security, carbon neutrality goals, all in one. Um, can we do it with what we have, or do we need to to go further? Um, Ambassador Keller, can I, can I begin with you? And you can just basically take any of those that you want and that you feel comfortable uh, discussing. Sure, sure, Brian. Yes, thank you. And actually, uh, let, let me, I think I might answer on each of them, actually, um, whether my answers are, are adequate, I'll leave you to, to judge. But let me be very brief on each of them, because I'm conscious of time. Number one is, I should, should say uh, that, as you probably know, that yesterday the European Union announced its 300 billion euro global gateway program. The president of the commission announced that. Uh, which is stems is based on the uh, connectivity approach between the EU and China in EU and Asia. So um, the global gateway is something which has um, standards, um, rights, sustainability baked into it. So it would be interesting to see how this develops. Um, and it is, as I said, it, it has uh, commanded a lot of resources from the EU. It's um, some people have said it's. Uh, uh, a, um, a kind of competitor with the BRI, that's, that's essentially not the, 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 the moving focus of it. I mean, it's something that the European Union, as a global player and global actor, um, wants to do. Secondly, um, go to the uh, Comprehensive Investment Agreement on sanctions. Let me just briefly say that, um, yes, I suppose this goes back to the old diplomatic challenge of who moves first in trying to diffuse that. But what I would say is that um, those sanctions were applied to members of the European Parliament. And the European Parliament is, under the Lisbon Treaty, the European Parliament um, has the power to ratify uh, agreements of this sort. So I think that's something that needs to be borne in mind that um, the CII, as I say, is stuck politically and there does need to be some movement on the issues you mentioned and also on some of the substantive concerns that uh, the parliament has too. Those need to be in some sense addressed. Um, on uh, the point about investment uh, protection. I think it's interesting that Ireland is the only country in the EU, I think, that does not have an investment protection agreement. And the reason being is that we have an extremely rigorous written constitution, which protects the rights of individuals, but also uh, property rights too. Uh, we have a common law system, uh, like our neighbours who left the EU, uh, but we have a written constitution. So I think a lot of responsibility does devolve on the state uh, receiving the investment. They need to have a rigorous uh, constitutional and legal system. Um, the, uh, on waste uh, recycling, uh, there has been uh, a cooperation between the EU and China on that, also on the question of plastics. 
that needs to be worked out more. There are a whole number, innumerable number of EU China projects, some of them dating back to 2005. And I think one of the things that really needs to be done is a lot of those need to be looked at, redesigned, shaken up, made fit for modern purpose. Uh, I think there are an awful lot of them. Uh, and, you know, they've been overtaken in some cases by events. Others work very well. But I think that's something that needs to be looked at. So I hope I've answered the questions. Oh, finally, in CBAMs. Yeah, I mean, it's important that there be as much discussion as possible, um, you know, between the EU and China, but also more uh, broadly on CBAMs, because uh, CBAMs do um, present challenges in terms of WTO compatibility, but they offer a huge uh, clean ways of addressing the question of carbon leakage. So I think that's something that needs to continue to be worked at. And look, thanks, Brian. I haven't trespassed too much on your time. Oh, that's that's perfect. Thank you. And 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 agree. I think we need to definitely look um look at CBAMs. Maybe it's not maybe it needs a little bit of tweaking, but uh but it's certainly the the, the way forward. Um uh Cliff, uh, Professor Chi, would you like to go? And maybe uh Anatole, if you can walk up to the uh podium so we don't waste time later. I'll I'll go to you next. Okay, thank you. Um thank thanks a lot. Uh a very uh, brief response to some uh, with regard to uh, Dini's first uh, question on, on further negotiations of sustainable development provisions, I, I think it is possible because, as I've mentioned, the, the CHI is a sort of built in pro progress. Uh, it's, it's moving, so the parties may engage in negotiations in the future on um, not only investment protection, uh, I dispute settlement, but also, I believe, on other uh, issues if both parties have interest in. Um, uh, the, the sustainable development chapter is not necessarily connected with the sanction issue. Uh, I mean, this is the ratification issue. Um, and another point, I, I, I think I, I completely echo uh, the ambassador's uh, view that um, uh, we should actually look uh, this the, the CHI from a broader picture. And actually, uh, in, in a few cases, I think the DG trade of the European uh, Union has, has already uh, actually mentioned that uh, uh, when um, when using or are looking for more regulatory autonomy, uh, EU is actually having a toolbox, and the CHI is one of the um, the instruments from the toolbox. So I believe that uh, also uh, back to your question, Brian, uh, you mentioned about um, uh, whether or not uh, Chinese overseas investments in climate change, energy, uh, energy security, and all kinds of issues could be uh, settled or kind of packed in one treaty like the, the CHI. I believe that this is not necessarily uh, uh, needed uh, given the, the outreach of these uh, investment treaty and also uh, given uh, the, uh, the regulatory autonomy thing. Uh, but of course, I, I believe that the parties may engage in negotiations in the future with regard to certain issues that may be uh, helpful in addressing the issues I've mentioned, for example, in uh, stressing more uh, corporate social responsibility and responsible business conduct uh, uh, criteria in the treaties or uh, some, some kind of uh, exception clauses in the treaty that would be helpful in addressing energy security issues. So I believe it is possible to uh, address certain issues um, but uh, this is not necessarily needed to address all issues, despite the very, very uh, title of comprehensive uh, treaty. So that concludes. Uh, back to you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Anna told you have your invisibility cloak on. Oh, there you are. Okay, yes. great. We'll, we'll go to you. Yeah, just uh, very briefly. Um, so allowances are allocated for free, I mean, partly to sectors exposed to uh, international competition. I don't think this inflates prices. On the contrary, I think when it, there will be full auctioning, it's, I mean, I'm not an economist, but I assume that full auctioning will, in fact, uh, push prices even more up, uh, upwards. Um, if price went up the way they did, it's mainly because of the um, intervention with the, the market stability reserve. And in the comparison with China, well, it's important to note that China is also allocating a significant part of its allowances uh, for free. So, um, so, 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 in a way, it's, it's uh, you know that comparison holds. I would believe, at least to some extent. Thanks. 
We don't have time for me to push you on that, but I, I will do so later. Um, but you're right. And I, and I think that 10 year phase out is, is, is one of the problematic uh, aspects. Um, uh, Ms. Jung, uh, would you like to, uh, to take the floor? Yeah, I, I would like to answer the uh, question about uh, who should be responsible. Uh, I think the host country, Chinese Overseas Investment Aid Project uh, recipient countries, uh, government uh, do have a role as a regulator, uh, regulate and manage uh, the, um, the in international investment uh, project in, uh, in their territory, in their jurisdiction, and the corporations, uh, Chinese uh, overseas investment or Chinese companies subsidiaries uh, have uh, their legal liability if they cause harms, uh, environmental uh, climate or human rights harm, it, they need to uh, be um, uh, held accountable for their violations. And regarding China, Chinese government and state, uh, as well as their um, the SOE, the headquarters or the parent companies liability, and that is a different uh, direction. And China does uh, need uh, uh, improve uh, the uh, overseas investment and, uh, screen, and, you know, uh, to prevent um, the harm to be to happen uh, at the very early stage of the uh, the life circle of the overseas investment. And so that is what uh, um, I have been calling for. China needs to add uh, environment and human rights due diligence at uh, um, the, when the uh, corporation re um, apply uh, for approval of, um, in, in China. So that's the early stage uh, um, China needed to regulate and add the screening requirements on environment, climate and human rights. And regarding the parent companies of those Chinese uh, subsidiaries overseas, and that become, uh, um, I think the legal uh, challenge and the difficulties and uh, look at the cases, uh, the transnational environment human rights cases in UK and uh, Europe and US. And you see when the, uh, the countries receive uh, international investment, the, when the institution is too weak uh, to protect the community's rights and, uh, and uh, when the community has uh, uh, have a exhausted uh, domestic uh, um, remedies, and they, I think they have, um, if they can find the avenue to uh, hold the parent company accountable, like the uh, the shell case, uh, shell um, headquarters has been held accountable. Uh, together with the subsidiary, Nigeria subsidiaries. So that is a legal avenue. Um, I think it's the most challenging legal avenue. It's not easy, and uh, but it's uh, possible. And this is my goal. And one day I will bring a case back to China and hold one of the uh, Chinese parent company account, account, uh, accountable. And um, I think each uh, of those uh, Chinese stakeholders has its own responsibility or liability. Uh, it depends uh, on the case, cases. And regarding Chinese banks, why the most Chinese banks are not uh, um, taking the, the, like the making the environment and social impact framework like the AIIB and other international uh, development bank uh, have, uh, have uh, because uh, I, I think the, um, uh, it's by, by nature Chinese, most uh, commercial banks are state owned and they are not uh, 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 transparent and they are not used to the international rules, international uh, practice. Uh, it takes time for them. And I hope this, uh, the pledge of no oversee a uh, coal plants uh, or the commitment to China's commitment to climb could be, uh, 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 yeah, could trigger uh, the change on the uh, Chinese financiers. And uh, uh, that is uh, my hope. I think many uh, NGOs and uh, environment lawyers, human rights lawyers are working to that uh, direction. We will hope and we push uh, Chinese financiers uh, to be more transparent and the agreements mechanism to accept com uh, communities com uh, complaints. Um, that is our hope. And uh, so I will end here. Thank you.
Great, thank you. And we managed to to claw back our time and, and basically uh, finish on time. So I would like to uh, thank the, the four speakers uh, for contributing and for supporting the, uh, the Center for Comparative and Transnational Law at, at CUHK Law. Um, it, we really, of course, rely on the, on the goodwill and expertise um, of you. So, so we really appreciate it. Thank you again uh, for, for taking the time. And, uh, and also thank you to the audience, uh, wherever you may be in the world, for joining us. Um, I mentioned we have some upcoming seminars, one, one further in December and two in January. Uh, please, please join us uh, for that. So thank you again and uh, good evening.